And hello to everyone there in person. It's sunny uh, SJSU. It, it looks like it's sunny today. Uh, my name is Dara Hoffman. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Information, as well as the program coordinator for the Master of Archives and Records Administration. I always joke that I teach at SJSU way, way north. I live in northern British Columbia, Canada. Uh, my co-PIs here with me today are Dr. Michelle Villagran, also in the School of Information. Uh, she is in LA. And of course, there in person, you have our one wonderful in-person hostess, as well as our co-PI from the computer science department, Dr. Nada Attar. Uh, not able to join us today are Dr. Shuvik Ghosh, also from the School of Information, and Dr. Sohair Nojan from the Department of Sociology and Asian American Studies. Uh, so this is our very first ever Circle Speaker event. And we are thrilled to have Dr. Fatima Albar to talk to us about Agile as a Mindset. And so, First and foremost, we're thrilled. This is like the first ever ever. It's our inaugural event and we are delighted to be able to have you with us. And we're also so excited that we can finally publicly share for the first time with the world that Circle is an a Mozilla Responsible Computing Challenge awardee. Uh, I saw Ziad is here in the audience. Um, so yes. Uh, is the answer exciting? We can't tell you how excited we are to be part of the Mozilla family, to have had, Michelle and I just came back from Boston where we had a wonderful kickoff, and to bring all of those exciting responsible computing perspectives and opportunities to y'all, our students and faculty at SJSU, regardless of your discipline, your background, even if you're like me and you're always terrified you're going to break something if you do anything other than Word. And so we want to first off say thank you. So in the very the first project I trained in under my doctorate, we always used this proverb that we got from our team in Africa, which is if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And this wouldn't be possible without the generous support of our many funders uh, who fund the Mozilla Responsible Computing Challenge, and of course our partners at SGSU. So in addition to our respective departments and the College of Professional and Global Education, we've gotten wonderful support from the Center for Faculty Development and eCampus. And if you're faculty, you're going to see some of our work products rolling out through CFD and eCampus in the days to come. We're also really lucky that at SJSU, this is not new ground to be broken. Uh, our Digital Humanities Center has been doing wonderful work in tech ethics and digital humanities for a long time, including um, pedagogical materials, open source, digital humanities, pedagogical materials, and they uh, provide their support as well. And so we want to thank them for being the newest part of the Circle family. And if you uh, need to, some resources, we suggest you also check out theirs. So what you can expect from the Circle Project in the year to come, and we are just so thrilled to be able to do all this for our all of y'all. Um, we're going to have more speaker series events. This is the first one. I see that all y'all in person are gonna have to eat a whole lot of pasta today, uh, but we're hoping to have this grow um, and we would love your feedback after the event on what topics you would like to learn more about. So some of the ones we're uh, thinking about are having someone come to talk about indigenous data sovereignty, for example. Um, or cultural computing, all kinds of interesting topics. And especially for the students, we really want to hear what you guys would like to learn more about. Um, and then it's also important to know that this is not just a speaker series. Part of the reason that there's lunch and all that is we'd love for you to stay and chat about what you've learned, uh, your perspectives. Y'all are very important in responsible computing. Your voices matter, your experiences matter. And so we want to be creating those spaces for you and welcoming you into that space, especially into like the tech space in a way you might not have always felt welcomed. Uh, for our faculty, we're going to have training modules through CFD on responsible computing pedagogies for both tech folks and non-tech folks. Um, so if you find yourself going, I'd really like to know more about data privacy and how to incorporate that into my courses. We got you. We'll also have teaching materials full on Canvas modules that you can drop right into a course. Uh, we're going to offer a new course on human computer interaction that will be offered for both the iSchool and the Department of Computer Science uh, at the undergraduate level. 
and course revisions and courses ever from uh, sociology methods and Asi introduction to Asian American studies to computer vision and uh, thinking with data. And finally, of interest to y'all students, we're developing our Responsible Computing Student Action Guide. And this is ways that you can start to make your voice heard in our tech ecosystem and to be a broader part of it, to find your power, find your voice, uh, and make the world maybe a little bit less terrible and a little bit more just and inclusive. So thank you all so much for being here. And it is my great pleasure to turn it over to our wonderful in-person host, Nada, and to Dr. Fatima Albar. My name is Fatima Albar. I, um, I work uh, at Triple. And be, here's my LinkedIn and uh, my website. Um, beside that, before I start, I would like just to give kind of some sense about who, who you are and where you are. Um, any undergrad? All of you. Okay, great. That's good. Uh, and online, I don't know how we can get the post from online, but we'll figure that out. Uh, grad one? A two. Nice. Uh, which majors? Computer science? Software. 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 Uh, software. software. Computer science. Computer science. Great. Computer science. Just to let you know, you are only 6% of American go to computer science. So congratulations. You are only 6% of, not just of American, of people who go to school in America. There is about, uh, the percentage has been increasing, but there is about 60% of American, 50 to 60% of American go to school. And out of that, only 6% go to computer science. I think um, internationally, it's 7%, 7 to 8%. So still, you are among those few people who could get to this major uh, among uh, globally, among people who are lucky enough to get there, uh, get to school. Working? Perfect. Okay, who I am? I'll start with that. Um, I was born and grew up in Saudi Arabia, in the Middle East, uh, until I get my undergrad studies there, and then I moved to the States. Um, moved between three to four states, but uh, I have been in Oregon for uh, 20 years. So, um, Oregon, Portland, Oregon is known by, beside hiking and waterfalls, and nine months of thing, it's mostly known for two things. Two industries or two big companies. Any guess? Yeah. Nike is number one. <laughs> we have the Nike headquarter there. So you will find majority, lots of people in Portland, they work at Nike. The other option is Intel, which Intel, we have the biggest campus of Intel in Oregon. Um, lots of people, they think Intel is the headquarter. He's in California, but Intel is mostly um, Oregon based. These are the two things that we are famous with, besides uh, being weird and all other stuff. Okay, through my career, I was in the, uh, in the academia for a very long time. I was teaching, I was doing research. I did research with Project Management Institute. I did. Uh, I was adjunct professor for a while. Uh, I did some consulting with startups and with different companies. But uh, those are the other names of the companies that I work with. Uh, in addition to that, I started a startup and uh, I decided not to go, not to continue with that. It took me three, four years and then I stopped. And I started a business also on the side and I decided that that business needs different plans. So uh, still in, on, on hold. So uh, you can, I'm not going to go through these, but you can read more about them in my LinkedIn if you're interested. The idea is I went from academia to big corporates, to startups uh, with different sizes. And that's where I'm gonna try to cover part of in this uh, lecture of what is the difference between all of these industries. Uh, being from Oregon, I like hiking. I go hiking, I go, I did the uh, paragliding ones, I did the um, zip lining. Uh, I like to discover new things and try new things. And last, every year or two, I try to do something different. So last winter, I started horseback riding lessons. Still stick to that, still doing it. This is my kitten. Uh, uh, his name is Chico. And I have two children. Here's about them. I didn't add their pictures. They are college students, so they're, they're not here. But I love summertime. And 
I always, well, I know we are in the fall, but I live in the summer still. I, last summer, last year, last summer, summer of last year, I, I did the hard, level five water rafting. And to do level five water rafting, it's one of the fastest and most, uh, it's it, it's kind of the highest that you can go with commercial group. Higher than that, you have to be either expert or go with a small group that they don't talk, they don't take groups to it. So I will share the video and then I will tell you why I'm sharing this video. Oops. This was the last rattle, which is the hardest one. The plan was, <laughs> the plan was that we, if, if we go fast enough, we will pass the, the rattle and then we will land. And what happened is we were fast, but not fast enough to, to kind of fly through it. So we it, it fell and we dropped and we were in the water. The team were really agile, really effective. They were uh, expecting some risk to happen. So in less than 90 seconds, all of us, if we flipped in the water, we're out of the water. Because otherwise it will be, either we'll go with the stream and it's more, more risk and more dangerous, or the water was 52 degrees. So they didn't want to risk anyone. But the efficiency, the agility, the fast moving of, 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 the, of the crews, they, they really um, were organized to get everybody out of the water very quickly and, and, and get that to be in a safe place. Uh, so now you know what is agile. It's about being fast, being rapid, uh, uh, anticipate risk, and do it. So <clears throat> uh, we can conclude this picture. I'm, I'm <laughs> kidding. We're going to stay here for a little bit longer. Anyone knows anything about agile? What is it? Yeah. It's like, uh, fast, like dynamic programming or like you're like <laughs> programming in a way that gets a big shit. Nice. suits with the team. Yeah. Please. Great. Anyone else? That's mainly the idea. The agile means being fast, being dynamic, uh, anticipate risk. Don't spend too much time to plan for what you're going to go through. Plan enough to go fail or, 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 or sense what's going on and, and adapt fast. And, and this is why I put the, the rafting because that was mainly what we were doing. Um, so agile as a mindset bigger than what we do in software industry, it's about all of this. It's about uh, setting goals, uh, customer focus, self-organized, about being collaborating together, uh, having the growth mindset, being flexible, and we're going to go through some of these. So uh, agile really started in 2001 for software, and then from there, in the past 20 years, it's become across all industries. Like even you will fast some sales, some customer success, some finance, they adapt to agile methodology. So it's uh, it started for software, but hardware companies and other companies are also adapting to it. The idea is we can build the, the minimum valuable product. And you will hear a lot about the MVP, that what is the, what is the smallest thing that you can deliver and give it to the customer so they can work with it or they can try it. Uh, so, for example, if we are planning to do green build the, the, the whole vehicle thing, uh, we get, we're get we not going to go to do it, kind of go with one wheel, to two wheels, and then have the body, and then have the car ready to be shipped. Because that's going to take way too long, and it's um, nobody can use any of this until it's a whole vehicle. Uh, the way that we do it is, what is the purpose of building this? The purpose is to move from point A to, we fo always focus on what, what's the problem we're trying to solve, what's the purpose of what we're building. So the purpose is to get from point A to point B with less effort and mm, quicker or, fa or faster or less time. Then well, how can I reach that? By having a skateboard, scooter, then a bike, and from bike to motorcycle, and then we need a body or whatever for, for rain or for cold or for, or to be faster and we build a car. So the, still the customer can, can try the product in all different phases. We don't have to wait until the final product we have it for the customer to try. And 
that's a way that we are doing business today, especially lots of business that adapt to this style that they don't want. If you think about the business 20 years ago, it was kind of have a fancy office, get everything ready, get the team ready, and then start building the business. Uh, today, we don't do the business in that way. Uh, even for business, we start by trying the product, get it to the market, and, and from there, expand. Uh, one example of that, that, that is not in software, not in industry, is salt and straw. Salt and straw, they started with three flavors, just on a, on a, on a part for festivals. The, the concept was good. They had a truck, ice cream truck. The concept was good. So in every in every phase of what they have, they they had a whole kind of business model. They have marketing, sales, product, uh, customers, uh, advertising in the small scale, and on the, on the, on the, just on the carton festivals. Then an ice cream truck. Then they had the first store. I don't know how many stores they have now, but they they are across across the, um, uh, almost all states or most of the states. And you continue with this model and everything. That if you want to do something, especially if you're trying innovation, if you're trying a new product, if you're trying a new recipe, if you're trying anything that's new to the world, we will not wait until we have the final product with the final with with all uh, with with all the features. With and we try it in, in a kind of a, in a small way and uh, and keep the kind of the, the the valuable product all the time. That we have a minimum valuable product that the customer can try. It. Feel free to interrupt me at any time and ask any question. And online, you can do the same thing on Zoom. I don't know how to see them, but <laughs> yes, but you can. Uh, I don't see the chat, but you can um, unmute your mic and ask questions. If people so, want to ask questions, I'll be happy to read them out to you, Fatima. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so the old style of, of doing software, and especially not just software, for the most of the innovation for most of business, we used to kind of get the requirement. What do we want to do? And after we get, it's kind of an assignment, the, the style of the academia, that you get the assignment, you get all the requirement, and then you start by designing it, and from design, you go to implementation, and we call this a waterfall, because it's uh, every step is really rely on the step, uh, the dependency on the step before it, and you take it and go with it. What's the problem with this? Really, there is no problem, except we don't, Every one of these steps rely on the step behind before it, but also many times you need the feedback. So after you do the analysis, you go to the design, but many times you get some feedback from design and you need to go back to analysis. It, it's not really straightforward that you go from, you have all the requirement up front and you can go from there. It, you have some of the requirements, you do the design, you want to validate the, the design because you don't want to, if you keep going until you have the, the implementation and you put it in the market and you get feedback, it's too late. It's too expensive. It's uh, mostly your competitors already are there. So if you wanna if you wanna do it fast, you will you will do the first one, get get some feedback, get to the loop back, and this loop is going back and forth in all the all, all the phases. Like any phase, you can go back to the phase before it and you continue. And that was happening in, in, in waterfalls and this, but they didn't deliver it to the market until they finished all of these phases, which sometimes take two to three, four, five years, depends on the product, especially if it's hardware, which means that you start working on something, you sell it years down the stream, and then you get the feedback if it's good product or not, if the customer will adapt it or not, which means you invested all of this money for all of these number of years, and then you get surprised that it's working or not working. And what we're trying to do is to avoid this and move faster, get the feedback faster and, and, and make the loop moving. I uh, These are some of the roles that we you, you hear it a lot in the industry, that there is there is a product owner, there is a project manager, there is a business analyst, uh, uh, chief technology officers, and when you go, you will have this, but in with Agile, some of these roles have been kind of either meshed to different roles or disappeared. For for example, product owner, we still have product owners. It depends on the size of the team, size of the company, but most of the time you will have a product manager. Uh, project manager, mostly will have program manager. Uh, business analyst, sometimes that's that role is distributed between multiple people. Uh, system architect, sometimes, many times we have the architect working with the design, design and development, 
many times they work one team. It depends on the size of the company and where are you with that. Um, do we have people to test at the end? Sometimes, most of the time, we have people to test in every phase. So how do we do software is mostly, or not just software, but lots of business where we do it in this way. We do design, implementation, uh, we go in the loop, uh, development, testing, and then releasing. So if, for example, um, if you think about, I don't know if there is a system like that or not, but if you if you want to make it easier for patients who move from a state to state or from a hospital to hospital without getting a record, they can go to any hospital. Hospital, hospital can access the record anywhere. Let's say we have a unified system for, for health where that unified system allow you to go to any hospital and they you don't have to go to your doctor and they still will have your um, health record. If you start, if you want to start the startup or start the idea and say, okay, I'm going to build this health um, database where everyone can, can get their, their health uh, records from anywhere. If you start by, I don't know what's the big hospitals here. In Oregon, we have Providence and Kaiser. What do you have here? Okay, let's say any of these two. You're going to start with, you. if you want to start with all hospitals across all California, that's a lot. And this is why we say when we when we do this agile methodology, we, we're not going to start with every hospital in the state. We're not going to start with every hospital in the U.S. We're going to start with two. Say, let's say hospital X and hospital Y. We're going to say, okay, well, how is the database structured here? How is it structured here? What can we do? What is the first feature that we can build to connect these two together? You know that there is payment you have to put. You know, there is insurance you have to put. There is unified user interface. There is uh, one password access you want. But you're not going to care about all of this in the beginning because you want to focus on one feature, which just combine these together, so you can when you when anyone log in can be able to navigate these two at least big hospitals, and that will be maybe this and test that. Go to these two hospitals. Go to some number of patients. Do you like it? Are you okay with it? Yes, this single feature is working well, and then you're gonna go to say, okay, what's the most important second feature? Should I unify the interface? Should I have one access user, uh, one password? Or should I do um, unify the, like, the, the format of, the, of those files? Whatever it is. And you're going to decide on the, the next feature. And you're going to build that feature. And then you're going to go to the third feature. And maybe after that, you say, OK, I'm going to have a third hospital. I'm going to have a fourth hospital. I'm going to include these. I'm going to figure out how I'm going to make them pay me to do this. Because now I have a proof of concept. I have three, four features, and I can start making them pay. Are they going to pay per patient? Are they going to pay per size of the record? Is it big or small? Are they going to pay per membership? Uh, number of... you will fi So as you go, you're not just figuring the software. You're figuring the software and the business model that goes with that software. Because you're building features, and with building features, you're building business. And you need to think about the business, or how the business is going to grow. And to figure all of this out in the beginning, it's too expensive. You will spend two, three years just researching to see how the, like the, the, the whole industry in, in the health industry is working. And by the time you start coding, by the time you start developing, it's too late. It might be other other software and uh, competitors out there, or you are, it, it's too late because you're not getting any income through these years when you're doing the research. So building it in this way, allowing lots of people, and this is why you see lots of startups starting, because if you, if you want to only build this feature while you have your full-time job, you still can do that. Building this feature might take you a few months, part-time, but still you can do it when you are doing your, your full-time job. Uh, or when you're studying. But if you try to build the whole system while you're doing something else, it's impossible. If you try to build the whole system without income, it's also hard. So building it one by one, testing the market, getting the feedback, getting who's willing to pay for this, even $1 doesn't have to be a price, and we grow with this. Any question? Too much?
Too fast? <laughs> Good? Okay. So how do we do this? Uh, the way that we do this and is not by having no plan, because that's that's kind of um, ridiculous if you go to start your business or to go, or if you have any software company that want to develop software and they have no plan, we were, we're not going to go anywhere. Um, and the other extreme is, as I say, to have all the plan is also extreme and it's hard to find it. So the rough plan mostly focus on I have, I have, I know where I'm going. I know what's the final product should look like or what's in my mind or what do I want to, what's the problem I want to solve? And engineers, we always focus on the problem. This is the problem. I want to solve this problem. Uh, and from there, I will just put, okay, what is the rough plan for that problem? How I'm going to solve it? What's the architecture? What do I need? Like skill set, what do I need? And what do I need to build? Because once I know what I need to build, I will know the skill set and I can find these people either to hire them or to be partnered with or, or to, to get to develop the team that's going to develop this. Uh, this is how we do it. When you, ha when you have um, kind of um, teams and you structure the teams, is you the team plan their work every two weeks. Some of them do it every four weeks. Depends on the... On, Software usually one to two weeks, hardware usually go longer, but you plan what do you want to develop in this, in this period of time. In two weeks, I want to have this interface clean. In this two weeks, I want to have one method of payment. Let's say credit card. I'm not going to care about Binmo or any other, or PayPal. I'm just going to have one payment, whatever it is. You have a period of time, you have a goal for that period of time. And that's what we do in that period, that we're going to develop, we're going to design, develop, and test until we have that feature complete, and then we release it. But in the backlog, I have a list of everything. That, like if I'm going to do payment, I have a list of all the payments that I want to include. Venmo, PayPal, credit card, uh, I have all of these lists. I'm not going to start with everything in the, in the, in the vision. I'm going to just take one of them go put it in the backlog for that for those two weeks implement them test them release them so in in period of one month sometimes less the customer can see this if like if today i don't have on my website i don't have any payment method in two weeks my customer should be able to see the payment method and 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 this is why it's fast customers feel that you're 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 giving them something all the time so this is not bad. This is not terrible. I have a bad, like, it's, it's it's kind of what you do. You have a long to-do list. You pick um, homework projects, la, la, la. You pick one of them. You say, I'm going to finish this. You finish it, and then you take the task after that. That's kind of makes sense because we, in our life, mostly we do this. This what makes it more complicated. When I joined Intel, it was my first job after PhD after yeah. academia. Um, I was in academia after I finished my PhD, I was a professor for a number of years, and then I joined Intel. So they gave me a title of vertical program manager. And I was kind of, what the heck is vertical program manager? And then I realized that they have horizontal and vertical. Horizontal are mostly scrums or, or, or team, engineering teams. And verticals is the, the business sector. So everything client, which is kind of, uh, PCs, anything, computer, um, game computers, anything like that under client. And then servers is for mainframes and servers. And then Internet of Things, that's kind of the term. And each processor is different and each thing is different. So I was responsible for one of these, the vertical ones, which means working with nine development teams. And those nine development teams were um, almost all over the world, from India, China, Malaysia, uh, Seattle, Portland, East Coast, California, Arizona, many different places, just to organize their work, to see what we're going to test and what we're going to develop. Because we receive the design from the, from the design team, where they design the circuits. And then we have, we have to test it virtually or, or by code. We don't have a, we don't send it to their app yet. And once it's tested, we go back to the design, telling them, change this, this is not working, blah, 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 get back. And we do that iteration back and forth for, for a while until we prove it. And then 
for hardware, it's harder because you don't send it to the lab until you're kind of 100% sure it's going to work. Because printing the, 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 the motherboard, printing the ships is too expensive. And if it comes back with defects, that would cost the company millions. And this is why we have to make sure about this. So what are these? These are kind of digital, analog, whatever, memory, all everything that you have in the ship, there is a team responsible for. And and with that, there is this project timeline and all of this. So now the Scrum team is not just one Scrum team. Now there is this Scrum team, and this Scrum team, and this Scrum team, and this Scrum team. And there is businesses between them. Because if you are doing the interface and I'm doing the back end, uh, you're waiting for me and I'm waiting for you. So we need to decide like which piece is going to come first. And if you're going to do this piece, which date, which date you're going to finish it. So I can take it from there. If you're going to work from Monday to Wednesday of this feature, I can start on Tuesday or Thursday. If it's gonna, you're going to take this week, I'm going to start next week. So we, one of big part of my job is organizing it between these teams because this engineering team, they really don't look beyond what they're doing. And that engineering team is doing the same thing. So the to, to go and make sure that all the dependencies are there and the timeline is there, so we will ship on time. That's part of what makes the kind of job is interesting. It's kind of you, if everything is going smooth, I just go and watch them. If anything is going wrong, and let's say this is not checked, then this is not going to be checked, then there's dependencies in everywhere. And that's between just development team in one org. If that is, then when you think about cross-function, you do the same thing. Here is your scrum teams. Here's your engineering organization. You guys are doing a good job, but there is product that's talking to, to the customers and they want something different. And then there's customer success that they need some training and they need some documentation. And then there is marketing that they're already putting that, that advertising outside. And there is the, this event that they're going to announce this feature on. And sales that already promised the customer that the product going to be out in July and we are in October and the product is not still there. So all of this thing need to be organized together. And that's also part of my job as a program manager um, is when you're responsible, you're responsible for the whole program. And the program is that kind of, sometimes it's just a product line, like for this product, everything related to that product, we take responsibility for. Sometimes it's just R&D. So it doesn't really have marketing or, or, or sales, but it's, have, it's, it's deeper communication between the uh, engineers. And it, it, it really depends on the program that you run with. But the idea is being agile is not just for the developers. The developers and the impact of that is in cross functions in all the whole company. And if there is legal department, the legal departments will be part of this. If there is, it, it's, it, it can go as a snowball everywhere to, to the whole company. So it's um, if you plan it, if you if you do your agile, it, once the, if if the software engineers are agile, then everybody else needs to be agile. They need also to learn how to adapt fast and move fast. They can kind of put things in concrete if we don't know when we're gonna deliver this feature. Good so far. Sure. Okay. Now we're gonna go. What if it's cross companies? What do we do in that case? Like, and I, I did that for a while. I did that for almost a year and a half, and then I said I can't do this anymore. Um, it was between Intel and Microsoft. For the ship to work, Windows needs operating system needs to adapt with the new feature of the ship. And then so all the whatever you build on the ship, you need you want to make sure that the software is compatible. So there was, a, we were doing all of this craziness with Intel, and then we want to make sure that we will send the board to Microsoft. We will get the binaries from for the Windows early on, so they will test the chip. We will test the binaries, and they have they have their own agile, and we have our own thing. And anything goes wrong in one company, will make the other companies going wrong. Of course, the cost of this is billions. 
And you don't want a scalation to go to the CRO because once it's the relationship between companies, it's a scalation goes to the level of CRO right away. So it's it's a, it's really interesting, but means meetings at 5 a.m., meetings at 11 p.m. It's it's fun, but it's different. If if you're up to it, it's really fun to work with cross companies, but it's um it's a lot. Uh, for smaller companies, we still have integration. Like we, Puppet has integration with ServiceNow. Um, we, uh, Kribble, uh, we have integration with uh, Xabeam, for example. We, those integration always happen. But it depends on the size of the companies, the size of the integration, you see the impact. Uh, Intel, they, like within Intel, you will find Intel Amazon, Intel Apple, Intel Siemens, Intel uh windows i was just with intel windows and it was a nightmare and they cannot imagine intel dell intel those are departments with 500 600 it's like a company running by itself just to organize this work between two different companies and make sure that deliveries from here are gonna get to this on time and vice versa <clears throat> questions very good okay is this complicated enough <laughs> Why? Why are we doing all of this? And why are we going through Agile? And why we're, if, especially if it's complicated to that level, wouldn't it be easier if at the beginning of the year we say, hey, Microsoft, we're going to build all of these in this year. Give us this. End of the year, we receive it. Yeah, it will be easier. Definitely waterfall is easier. But in reality, in those 12 months, change, things change a lot. Customer request, customer need change, economy change, um, wars happen. What is the relation between that and companies? Everything related to stock market, stock market related to shareholders. Shareholders, they have their voice to say, hey, we're not anticipating next year people will be able to buy a laptop with this amount of money. Or we're not anticipating that the demand for server is going to grow in this much as we expected. So if that demand change, why don't you pro provide us with something less expensive or more expensive or the demand going to be bigger or the demand going to be smaller? So it's really more complicated than being just, I set the goals and I go and implement it. it I hope it is, <laughs> but it's not. It, and this is why being agile is kind of moving and moving faster. And one of the important things is, um, before we move to that, uh, one of the things about being, I wouldn't say being rigid, but being not able to adapt fast is what happened with um, with iPhones when or with smartphones when it uh, came out. I think it was 2006 when uh, Steve Jobs went to Intel and, and they have the agreement and they talked about they want uh, a SIM, uh, SIM card, not the SIM card. They want a processor for the phone. And that processor has to be fast enough, doesn't have to be as fast as PC, has to be fast enough, doesn't consume the battery, doesn't heat, so it can be used on a smartphone. Until in the beginning, say, yes, we're going to do it, and then we're not. But the, the idea is Intel was the lead of making microprocessors. And for them, they made the most complicated one, the fastest one. Now to come and tell them, give me something that's not as fast, not as expensive, not as complicated. So it's supposed to be easier. Like if you think about it, if you are A students and I'm telling you solve this problem at C level, not an A student level, it's supposed to be easier, but it wasn't. And they started with that for a little, and then Apple went and they tried different, uh, they they developed, they started a com different company with ARM with different uh, uh, players. But Intel started from 2006, I think until 2016 or 17, with the smartphone. They could not develop sim like enough, a processor that's cheap enough, fast enough, and it doesn't take the battery and doesn't heat much because their mindset was we develop the best. And it was hard for them not to develop the best. So part of being agile is you might go to, to the to harder level to compete in the market. And it might be the opposite. You might just need to deliver something very simple that another market needs it. And uh, with this internet, 
I don't remember the number, but it, the, 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 of course, the smartphones industry is is huge. And until today, Intel is not part of it because they missed that window. So the it's always they always say in theory that we we have these the triangle of cost, time, and scope, uh, and do not do not compromise with quality. Quality is the thing that you don't want to compromise with. You can add more time, reduce more time, add more costs, reduce more costs, add more scope or reduce it, but do not compromise with quality. In real life, you're juggling these things, but you're not juggling. The, the cost most of the time goes with the time because it's rarely, and I'm saying rarely because it's rarely happens that you go and say, I have a team of five and the deadline is next month and we cannot deliver, give us two more engineers. It really happened that they will give you two more engineers. So what happens usually is you have the time. Time means cost. Like if I delay it for another uh, two weeks or another three weeks, that's salary that I'm paying. So time and cost becomes almost one thing. And what are we playing around is time, quality, and scope. That I either have to um, deliver on time, but reduce the scope. I cannot give you all of this. I cannot give you five different methods of payment for next month. I can give you one or two. And we can negotiate that. Uh, or I'm going to sacrifice the time. And you, you want five different methods of payment? It will be in December. It will be next year in January. Or give me more engineers, which mostly doesn't happen. So... What we don't want to sacrifice, we don't want to sacrifice the quality. But what happens in most cases, because engineers, because managers, they don't change scope. They didn't change time. So what, what happens is we sacrifice that. Okay, what can we do not to, sac to keep these things without sacrificing anything is priorities. And with priorities, I will tell you, there's some sticky out that's not trying. Huh. Interesting. Uh, with priorities, I would say always think about the priorities. What is the most important thing that I need to start with? It's and that most important things can vary and can be different because it, it goes both ways. There is there is feature that has have a high impact, which means I know if I put this feature, most of my customers are gonna use it. If not all of my customers can use it. So this feature has high impact. Are they willing to pay more for this feature? No. So it's high impact, but what should I put in priority? Because the high impact is not going to bring me much revenue. And there is this feature that one customer wants, but that customer is willing to pay $2 million for that feature. Which which one should go first? And then I have those, fe those urgent things, like this customer is blocked because this thing is not working, there is a bug, go and fix it. And always we struggle with these things. And that's where we go. It's, it's a product manager, TPM, engineering manager, sometimes CEO, sometimes CTO. It depends on the level of escalation. It depends on the, on the work that we are doing is to put the priorities right. And we change priorities. We put the priorities, we change the priorities. Because if the customer say, I'm blocked, and... um the Black Friday is coming soon. If all of these payments is not working, I'm going to lose this amount of money. That's urgent. That we have to work on it today. So by the Black Friday, this is this is up and running. And if we enable that enough, can we go back to the most impactful feature? feature? Can we go back to that feature that most of the uh, of the customers will, will want it? I I was with in, in, in one of the meetings, and that's part of kind of where the whole company, even as a developers, you need to understand um, the culture of the company, the priorities of the company. Because I was in a meeting um, with, in, with engineering manager, a tech lead, and the CEO was in that meeting. It's a small company, so the CEO was involved in that meeting. And we were talking about one of the customers come from, uh, one of the requests come up from a customer. The CEO asked this question, how big is this customer? Well, all of us, we didn't know how big is this customer, but what's the size of the contract? And he pulled it up in a second and he said, okay, this contract is less than 100K. If it's more than 100K, 
still, th this conversation shouldn't happen on engineering, like on engineering PPM level. It, this conversation should happen in the, between the sales and PMs, but if it's less than 100K, don't bring it to the table. If it's if it's 100 million, a half a million to more, then you prioritize it in your backlog. Then you bring it to engineers. So sometimes engineers and engineering manager need to ask this. You interrupt my work with this feature. Who wants this? Like, and how big is this contract? Sometimes it's not the big of contract, it's the big of a name. Like uh, Tesla asked for this feature. We we know that if we land feature Tesla, even if the contract is only 30,000, that's a big name that will encourage other companies to come and buy. So you, even as a software developers, your head will be down to writing the code, but understanding that dynamic of where are we going with this, you will, when you get interrupted and say, hey, stop working on what you're working on, take this and work on it. You understand why, why I'm dropping this and taking this, why this happened, why they keep changing their mind. It's not they keep changing their minds, it's what happens is there is demand coming. And when you when when you are like a small company um, or a startup or just with IPO, it, it depends really on the goal of that company and how they want to put the priorities. I, through my experience, some companies, their priorities at certain phase is just to land logos. They really don't care if it's a $5,000, $10,000, 20, but they want more people to buy from them because if if you land logos, that means other companies will come. And then the, you can increase prices, build new features, whatever it is. Other phases of the companies where they say, no, I don't really care about anything below 100K. Some of them, I don't, they say, I don't really care about anything less than a million. And for Intel kind of size or um, uh, AMD or one, one of those, I don't know what's the size where they cut it to say, I don't really care about these small customers. Uh, if the customer is big enough that we can, then we need to sit together and talk about the deep and the feature that comes with it. So understanding this helps a lot for, for even when you build your own code. Okay. Uh, Sony, uh, when they built, when they adapted Agile, I'm just bringing one example. They reduced the planning time almost by 30%, but 28%. They reduced their, um, the, they saved about 30 million uh, a year. And the downtime has been kind of almost reduced to zero because it's always, always planning, always execution, always delivery. Yeah. Agile has all of this. Like if with agile methodology, it goes that you have extreme programming, you have scrums, you have Kanban, you have safe. I'm not going to go through it. I'm just dropping it here for you. So if you, if you kind of want to know more about this, uh, each one of these, they have their own certificates. Some of the certificates are two months. Some of the certificates are online. Some of them you need to attend. Um, but it's, it's different ways of doing um, development, whether it's software, hardware, or, or building a business. Okay. Um, how are we doing with time? Okay. Are we good? Keep going? Okay. What does Agile mean to you as an individual? What does it mean to me as an individual? And as I said, Agile is a, Agile is a mindset. It's not just about um, software development or business development. It's it's about that you can be social and Agile. You can be ability to change in your life, ability to kind of to look at your professional career can be Agile. So it's a, it, it's a whole concept of the whole mindset where do I want to go? What's my goal? And then how can I be flexible enough to reach that goal? And, um, so the first thing, the first thing you take it to the job is what's your goal? Where do you want to go with this? Uh, I don't know if you know the, the, the story of Coca-Cola or not, anyone? Okay, Coca-Cola, they started it. It started in, I think, 1880 something. So about 130 years ago or something. The, the, the person who started it was um, um, pharmaceutical. And he started Coca-Cola as pain relief medicine. He added Coke to it. Uh, and he added lots of sugar. And he did the syrup as something that helped people with chronic disease or with, with, with the continuous pain to 
to kind of help their mood and smooth their um, their pain. And so they will, at least for the rest of their life, they can live without severe pain. And that was the purpose in that person's or scientist's mind that this is what Coca-Cola is. I think four years later, another pharmaceutical guy bought that recipe. And in, in the vision of the new one, forgot the names, but the vision of the, 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 the one who bought it is to have it as a drink for everyone. It's just a change of the, of the vision, change the market space because one is you're taking it as a medicine, so it's, and for specific cases that will be um, you have certain market size. When when the other one has the vision that this is going to be drink for anyone, he 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 kind of widen his market uh, space. But on, on ten on less than ten years, and I think in eight years, the the sales of it grow from ten thousand to hundred and something thousand um, liters of the syrup. And then it, it it went growing and growing because the vision and I think after after nineteen like after nineteen hundred with few years they remove the coke and they make it as a drink so anyone can can drink it. Coca Cola is one of the like the, the companies that it's uh, um, now it's whatever one hundred and twenty one hundred and something and it's involved in many different industries bottling uh, cans uh, and their sales is across the world and. All of this started by just a vision that what what is your vision is your vision is to have it as this or as this, and this is why I'm saying wow. even if you start small, you're gonna start with with um, MVP. You still need to know where is your vision, what's your eyes are on, and open for uh, possibilities. Uh, being agile means being flexible, and one of the things that we do as engineers, we get attached to our to our work, and that's one of the things that we. <laughs> Do not get attached to your work. You will work in the most fantastic code. And before you finish it, they will tell you priorities change. Drop this, pick something else. And drop it. I don't know for how long I'm going to drop it. I'm going to stop working on it. I'm going to pick something else and priorities keep changing. Do not get attached to your work. And do not get attached to your idea. Because sometimes we go and we are so enthusiastic. We want this idea. And you go and you propose the idea. And the answer is, no, we're not going to implement it. Um, in those cases, I would say, do not take no as an answer, but doesn't mean go and, and make trouble to, so to, to make it. It means understand why the no. Because sometimes the no is, I really don't have patience and, and I'm, I'm, I'm busy. And this is why I'm telling you no, because I don't have energy or I don't have time to listen to you. That's completely different between no, we tried this before and it didn't work. Also, you shouldn't stop by that. You need to understand what exactly we tried and how did we try it. And maybe you can modify your idea to adjust to what we tried before, to avoid that and try something different. Or maybe you would say, no, my idea is not what you tried. My idea is different. And you're just assuming that they are the same. So do not stop by no. And you will hear no a lot. Don't take it personal, but do not stop by no. Because most of innovation started by those people going to their manager saying, let's develop this. Their manager said no. They went outside. They started their startups and they built this new business. So they're not to stop by no, but understand why no. If, if there was enough research, learn from what they did before you. So you don't have to kind of repeat the same mistake. If it's no, because it's really, really, really a bad idea, a terrible idea, you will learn that, okay, this is what makes this idea terrible. And they can learn from that. So dig deeper and try to learn more. And then it was, we call it FAFO in, in the industry. And I don't know if you heard this or watched this video before, but I'm going to show you this video. Oh, the video is not available for some reason. The video is saying, the graph on this, the video is basically saying, here is the, uh, Here's a few, just two mistakes, which is fuck around. Right there, just gonna flip it. And here is, you will find out. And it goes like this. As many mistakes you make, as many mistakes you fuck around, you will you will find out more. And, and that basically was the video I was saying, but he was more funnier than me. And this is why I want to watch it. Uh, I would add to that, 
there is a third dimension. I don't know how to draw it yet, but there is a third dimension. Keep this with low cost. If you keep it, but you can grow fast, but with lowest cost that you can, that will be great. Because as you make mistakes, you're losing. You're losing time, you're losing money, you're losing energy, you're losing people who are believing in you. And try to do with minimum minimum cost. And then you will learn more. Oh, that should be this way, whatever it is. It's uh, just when you don't be afraid of making mistakes. The only way we as humans learn is by making mistakes. And otherwise, we will not be flying today. We will not have them all. We will not be scuba diving. We will not be doing most what we are doing today. So make mistakes, but be aware of your mistakes, where it's going to take you. I always tell my son, uh, as long as your mistake doesn't cost you your freedom, your brain, like we don't go with drugs or anything that costs you your, 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 your mental health and your health. These are the three things that be aware of that. And if you're a spiritual person, you're spiritual. Other than that, make mistakes. You break a bone, you will it will be fixed. You will do a mistake, you will lose a couple thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, you will make it up. Because the, the the amount of learning that you're gonna learn from this is is, is it, it's so huge. And this is why I'm saying if you do this fast, um like fail fast, stand up fast, and try and try again. Especially when you are younger age, it's you have a bigger room because you have less responsibility, less impact, less kind of cost. Try more, fail more, stand up more, and 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 be resilient. Uh, okay. You said this. Okay. When present, when to present what? This is an important one because if you have an idea, you need to know what's the right time for that idea. Because sometimes the company is not developed fast enough. Like your idea is great for the company after it's going public. The company is still small. So either take that idea to a different company or wait for this company to grow. Uh, knowing what to present, what it's critical. And one example for that, I, I was, when I was at Intel, I was putting slides for presentation and my manager went through the slides and she told me, remove the slide. I told her what we are working with Microsoft. This is like this isn't a good status, and she said if this, this presentation gonna go to this level of VPs, if they saw this, they would think it's an escalation, and that will go to Microsoft as an escalation. Just remove it since it's like you don't want to escalate. Remove it. So to know what to present to who is important because there is different level of the, the company and. Something gonna be understood in a different way. So knowing that the right timing is is, is critical. Um, say no when when you have reasons. Also, this happened kind of a few weeks ago. Uh, one of the, I was meeting with, with engineers, and the engineer we were they were discussing some architecture. I was just listening, but one of them said, "If we develop in this way, the customers will see increase in billing because we." We build them by terabytes or whatever the size. So if we just change this in the development, the bill gonna go this much. So that's a developer, and still that developer is smart enough to know the business model, to know how we charge the, our customers, and to know that hey, be careful, don't mess up with this because it's gonna mess up with the billing. And that's what makes some people kind of a business oriented. They grow fast in the company. They take higher positions. Okay, see the risk before it comes. Anticipate the risk. If we do this, what what might happen if we implement it in this way? Because even if we cannot cover all the cases, at least I know the risk because we're not covering all the corners. And I I, I need to anticipate. I need we need to, at least to keep that risk in our mind when we develop. Learn to negotiate. And negotiating negotiation goes all the way from the time you apply for job, like from the time you receive the 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 offer, learn how to negotiate all the way when you when you when you are working on on your sprint on these five features and your manager comes and say, hey, stop working on this, or can you fix this bug? We would say, okay, let me look, this bug gonna take this number of hours or days. What do you want me to drop? Because there is a negotiation. I can 
You can't finish all of this plus this. Unless if everything is critical, everything is kind of uh, on red, then you'll work overtime, but also negotiate that. I'm going to work overtime to do this. I'm going to have five nights without sleep. I'm just letting you know, and I'm going to get it done because you're not going to work all your life with, with four hours of sleep. If you can do it in a week when you have a release, but you're not going to do it for like, so those negotiations are important. Those kind of talks are important. Um, think out of the box. It's always important to think out of the box. If there is a solution that's cheap, uh, not too expensive, not going to take much time, propose that idea. And yeah, everything everything in life comes with a price. There is nothing for free. Like everything that you, it, it's either you pay time, you pay money, you pay um, team members, relationship, you pay something. And be aware of that. Okay, when I do this, what is the cost of it? And be aware of it and negotiate depends on those costs. That you want me to do this, it will cost me this. Adapt to the culture. As I said, some companies, they they want more logos. Some companies, they want more contracts. Some, some companies, they care about the size of the contract. Some company, it, what, what is the culture? What the, the, your companies uh, care about? And change is the inevitable thing. Things are changing fast, especially in software, especially in cloud industry, especially like in high tech these days, every few months you will find a new competitors, a new company, a startup, a new technology, something coming. And that means your plan will be changing all the time. So if you plan on something, don't hold on to it and be, be adapted to change. Yeah. One of the th concepts about leadership, especially from the from Hollywood that brings is the leader is the one who comes with loud voice, charismatic, mostly beautiful or handsome. And that's great. We need few of those leaders. But what we need is the leaders that if I know that you are blocked, I know how to enable you. If I know that you cannot do this thing because you, um, you're you waiting for someone to review your code so it can be released, I will bring that one in. in. Those are kind of leaders that we we want them, we need them in every in, with every team. Like, yeah, they're, they don't have to be charismatic, they don't have to be loud voices, but they are the real leader that they enable others to work, that they open doors, that they think out of the box and be that kind of leader because even in the beginning, if you feel that you're not recognized, you will be. Because those are the kind of people that motivates others to do. And people trust them and rely on them. And, and it takes time, but you will get there. And if you're going to take one thing out of all of this, whatever, one hour lecture, set your goals, have a plan, be flexible with this plan. You might need to stop more often. You might need to go different routes. You might need to, to avoid some obstacles. But be flexible and really enjoy the journey because if you wait for big accomplishment, those comes rarely. Maybe when you graduate and maybe when you whatever do something, launch something big, start a new job. But other than that, everyday life, there is something to celebrate. Try to think about those small things to celebrate because they are the things that keep us going. And, and when we do that, um, the one or two weeks scrum, uh, we try at the end of those two weeks to celebrate this new feature, even if the new feature is very small. But celebrating the small things is kind of making it, it's making us feel that we are, we accomplish things. So don't, in your life, even don't wait for big things to accomplish to celebrate. Celebrate the, every small step that you do, every small thing. How many credits you accomplished? What did you do in this, uh, uh, in this year? Those things that, really, really worth celebrating. And those are the things that keep us um, moving. Okay, this is what I have for you today. I think I was talking a lot and giving you lots of information. Thank you so much. And I'm open for any questions. Questions every day. Startups, big corporates, education, Yes. So, um, going back to Scrum, you said you had worked with like China and other international uh, yeah. teams, right? Was there any difficulty communicating with those teams at certain times? Yes. Like, would you have to stay up like until midnight to make a meeting? 
But one of the challenges is time zone. But sometimes you start meetings at 5 a.m. or 7 a.m. or whatever, depends on their time. Uh, 11 p.m. meeting, you'll find those happens. I wouldn't say often, but they happens a lot. Um, and then there's culture barriers. Uh, what, when they say something, do I understand it in the right way or not? And holidays. I think Malaysia is the country with most national holidays. I don't remember how many holidays they have, but it's uh, it's kind of we plan on something and we don't, and then we realize, oops, that's a holiday in Malaysia. We cannot count on them to work on that day. Um, it, it's nice to have people work on the other side of the world because that makes the, the development twenty four hours that you develop in eight hours, then the next company, next country, and then the other country. But it's harder to kind of make sure that everything is aligned and to get on time. Are there questions? And they're all online. Yes. What's the biggest challenge during COVID and during your diary? Yeah. In general, remote culture or remote work was a challenge. It was a challenge for everyone. For um, if you want to move fast, you want to make sure that you are using the tools, right? Because if the, because we're not in the office, we're not relying on communication with each other. We need to rely on something that this is the, 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 the state of the truth or the state of facts. And whatever tools that you are using to track the work, whether it's um, Jira or Asana or whatever, any different companies are using different tools. Ma to make sure that those tools are up to date, that makes the job is way easier. Teams that they do that is their life was way easier. The team that they didn't have that, it was really, really hard because it's kind of you have to communicate with each team to make sure that what is the status? Where are we? What's finished? What's not? We're supposed to release next month. Are we going to postpone? Are we going to reduce the scope? Sales are waiting. Marketing, are waiting. It, it, it's really tough. So using the tools and making sure kind of to, to, to build the tools in the right way, customize it in the right way to, to serve the, the teams, that, that's critical. Any other question? Any questions online from Zoom? I have no idea what's going on in there. We're all just listening and being, I, I've written down so many super quotes from you. Uh, I love your cry more, fail more, be resilient. Love it. Uh, so something I was wondering, though, is you you talked really beautifully about the fact that everything has costs. Uh, when we're moving so fast to get so, to that, you know, minimum valuable product, uh, how do we account for costs that might, might not be borne directly by, say, the company, right? But these kind of negative externalities, these costs that aren't ours, but nonetheless come from what we're developing. Yes. It's kind of in every budget, whether it's kind of a company budget, if, if there's a company budget, that there should be a room for those kind of uh, development or, or work that... Uh, some companies, they have it as every week you have one day for free development. Uh, some companies, they have they know that we're going to start this project or this product. They put it in, in the market as um, open source. And they say, okay, we're going to make money out of it. And then they realize that no money comes out of it. They kill the project. They keep it on open source. They kill the project. They kill the product. So it, there should be some budget flexibility or budget at least calculation for we have risk and that risk we can take it for 30% or 50% or depends on the size of the, the company. When if you're starting your own startup, mostly you're doing 100% risk because you're building something you don't know if it's going to go in the market or not. But after that, companies keep reducing this to say, but every company calculate for for some project, otherwise the innovation will not continue. They calculate for something that we're going to build it and we don't know how the comp how the the market's going to receive it, um, and they they put it in the side as as calculated risk. Um, but at least it's calculated. Like when you're building it, you know that this is going to take me this amount of time, amount of money, and I'm going to build it. It's calculated, and I know that I'm going to go with this for this period of time. I started a startup a few years ago um, to do kind of a renting. Um, peer to peer. Like if I have some, let's say I have at home a speaker, 
and I have few things for parties, or I have a car, and I have a uh, um, few, like, I'm an outdoor person, so I have multiple kayaks. And other people, they just want to rent that kayak for a day. Can they just go to my app and rent that kayak? It's like an Uber, but it's re- renting. Can they go online, see who's in the neighborhood, have a kayak, they rent that kayak, use it for a day, and return it back? So I did that. I built, developed the kind of the proof of concept, developed the app, and stopped using it. And then I faced the challenge of insurance. How are you going to make sure that this is insured? So if they damaged it, somebody going to pay for those people. Communicated with the insurance company, and they found that, it, that, that the cost that they want is too high. They want whatever, $50,000 just to start the contract. They said, okay. But after this, I had the the, the, the the proof of concept, I have the uh, the minimum valuable product, but then I killed that product because it's uh, I didn't have the I didn't have the budget to go through that test. So it's uh, it's the amount of learning that I got from that was huge. So I say that okay, the, the time and money and they put it into building this is kind of worth the, the learning experience that I got from it, and it's. It's how life goes. You cannot, you cannot have a try every day. You, you're going to try and try and try until some, something uh, um, make it right. 